Come on, would you just lift your hands right where you are? You know, sometimes there's moments whenever we gather together that the Lord is just looking for someone to agree with Him. And as we even were singing that song as a prayer to Him, what we're saying whenever we sing, God, let heaven fall. What we're asking is for the reality of the kingdom of God, the reality of the rule and the reign of God to invade firstly our hearts, secondly our homes, thirdly our friendship groups and our schools, ultimately our city and our nation. So right now in this moment, every single student and this and leader in this place, with your hands lifted up to the Lord, would you in your own way begin to whisper a prayer to the Lord saying, God, let heaven fall in my life, in my world. Would you take a moment and let's just pray that to the Lord right now. Come on, use your vocal cords, kind of step out in faith a little bit, maybe a little bit different. This is a stretch for some of us, but your prayers matter. What you say matters to the Lord. So I want you to get your family in your mind right now. I want, to get, I want you to get your school campus in your heart right now. And you can whisper up a simple yet powerful prayer that says, God, let heaven fall over my school. Let heaven fall over my family. Let heaven fall over my life, Lord Jesus. King Jesus. Father, we are asking that even over these two days, Lord, that what's happening in the hearts and lives of students and leaders, God, that there would be an overflow that spills over to the city, to the state, and ultimately to the region to make your name famous, to make your name known, to bring freedom and liberty to those who are in bondage, to bring the reality of Christ to this generation. Father, we thank you today. We love you today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Come on. You can make your way back to your seats this afternoon. Look at somebody on your way back to your seats and say it's going to be a great session. Come on, tell them with a little bit more enthusiasm. Say it's going to be a great session. Because God is here. His spirit is here. His word is alive and you are alive. Come on, how many of you had a great time yesterday? How many of you are blessed last night and, and feel like God really spoke something to you? Come on. It's so good. Even your small groups, I know that there was engaging dialogue and talk that was taking place, which is so, um, which is so amazing. I want to stop and just pause and you know, today is a significant day. It's a special day. You get to be off from school, but it's really because of a, a willing vessel by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. who made some sacrificial decisions. Come on, let's give it up. It's a big deal because he made some sacrificial decisions. He, he lived his life in such a way that we are still talking about him Today, across the nations of the world, his, his name is being whispered in small groups. His name is being declared, but he lived for the purpose and for the cause of fulfilling the call of God, fulfilling the assignment that God had placed on his life to accomplish in his generation. And I think that if there's anything of significance for every single one of you, he died at such an early age. Of course, he was assassinated so early, like late 30s, not even 40 yet. But, but here's the takeaway that I want every single one of you to walk away, even just thinking like, man, Martin Luther King Day 2020. And yes, man, we're going to exalt Christ and we're going to talk about the Word of God. But I want you to make a fresh commitment in your own life that you would be as committed as Martin Luther King was to the call and to the assignment that God had entrusted to his life. 
For him, it was bringing unity among the races. It was opposing those who would champion hatred over love and division and divisiveness over unity. But let me ask you this. What's the dream of God for your life? What is the invitation that God has invited you to live out in your generation? And then my question, and I want you to ponder this, is are you willing to make major sacrifices along the way to see that God-sized dream come to pass? Because any dream that's God-sized, that you're serious about, that's truly from him that you're committed to, it's going to require some great prices and some sacrifices for you to sort of make along the way in order to bring Christ the ultimate level of glory in your life. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that make sense to everyone? So when you think about that, th th this, this evening, I, um, I want to leave you guys with, um, with a final message that is, is so real to me. Just a couple months ago, I, I received a, a phone call, and uh, actually it was a text message first. I was preaching down in Texas, and I, and I received, a, uh, actually it was Facebook Messenger, and then several text messages uh, about a student who was in my youth ministry some years ago. So I was a full-time youth pastor for about 12 and a half years up to last year. Uh, just transition out of being a full-time youth pastor and still pastoring and mentoring and coaching uh, youth pastors and college pastors, but now more in a, in a traveling role all over. And um, th this young man who's in my youth group, his name was, his name was Keegan. And, and Keegan was uh, an interesting guy. He was actually adopted by our family in our church. And um, it was kind of a journey. It was a, it was a journey with, with Keegan. Like he would come to the youth group, like maybe some of you, and, and he would like be there. But half the time he wasn't like all the way there. You could tell like probably he went like kicking and stumping as his parents like made him come on Wednesday nights. And then some nights he would be sort of all in. But, but, but here's the deal about Keegan. If there was anything I ever needed Keegan to do, like, hey, Keegan, like, man, we need, we need help. I need you to show up early. We got to stack some chairs or we got to set up for an event or, you know, we're, we're doing like a homeless outreach, something. Keegan was like, he was always there. Like, early, like ready to go, okay? Running errands, serving, working, moving things. That, that was just his thing. Like that was just the way that God had wired him. And so he's pretty special to me. I know his mom and his dad. And so when I got this Facebook messenger, like a, a deal popped up on my phone. I'm like, you know, what's going on? Because it said like, hey, have you heard about Keegan? And I'm like, Keegan, oh, Keegan, Keegan Shell? Like what, what happened? And and in and, and the sex message just said like, he, uh, he was found dead, Night before, he's only 20 years old, and we don't know all the circumstances that were surrounding his, you know, we just know. this. And so at first I thought like maybe this is just incorrect information because this came from a cousin of his who used to kind of visit the youth group. Keegan would invite him, he would sort of bring him in. And so I'm like, I don't know how reliable this information is. And so I text some of my former youth youth. Uh, leaders and and they're like oh yeah and and come to find out sure enough he you know he's no longer on the face of the earth 20 years old and it just got me thinking it just it, it just reminded me of how fragile our our lives are you know the word of God says that tomorrow is 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 not promised so 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 do what you can for Christ today because we have a window of time. Turn to the person next to you and say, you have a window. Turn to the person on the other side of you and just say, you, you've got a window of time. And, and I want you guys from the front all the way to the back in the balcony, from the left side of the room all the way to the right, I want you to like really like for real lean in in this, last sec in this last session together. Because I think there's something of a little bit of weight 
that God wants to speak to you this afternoon that I think sort of warrants your undivided attention. And so, so go it on and just put out of your mind everything from yesterday, everything that's going, home at, going on at home, what you gotta do tomorrow. And I'm gonna ask you to be all the way here for the next 20 to 25 minutes or so. Just kind of be all in. Because I think there's some things that the uncreated God of the universe who wired you, who knit you together while you were in your mother's womb and, and who loves you so much. I think that he has a couple things. Matter of fact, I don't think I know that he has a few things that he wants to speak to you and kind of just put in your hearts and put in your spirits for you to kind of pray about, talk about, and, and some truths that he wants you to apply to your life. If you'll agree to do that, will you just shout amen on the count of three? One, two, three. All right, so we're all in. Y'all gonna help me? Y'all gonna help me preach in this afternoon session too? Y'all gonna help a brother out or what? All right, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I wanna go straight to the scripture this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter seven. And I'll be reading verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Two, uh, two verses, a short passage of scripture. Then we're going to unpack some things out of that scripture. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life, uh, a little bit of a, a deal that happened to me in college. And then we'll wrap this whole thing up with, uh, with you making some decisions. And with you making some choices, I firmly believe in preaching and teaching that calls you to a place of action. Come on, I'm not here just to tell you jokes or funny stories this afternoon. I did not leave my beautiful family in Colorado Springs uh, to come and play games with you, okay? Uh, that's what your friends are for. You can do that in your small groups and with your, uh, but, uh, but I came in order to speak something that I feel like God wants to say to you. And I want to call you to a place of response. And how you respond is your decision. Can't respond for you. Don't even want to. So let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. It says this. You can enter God's kingdom. Everybody say God's kingdom. Only through the narrow gate. See, the highway to hell song is broad. And its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But, everybody say but. but. We thank God for some buts in scripture. But the gateway to life is very narrow. And the road is difficult. And only a few ever find it. But the gateway to life it's a very narrow, it is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever, ever find it. Um, let's pray real quick, and then we'll jump in. Father, we just thank you so much for your voice that is real, that is significant, that is powerful. Father, it was your voice that transformed my life as a teenager, and it has been your continued voice in my life that has brought me to this place, and it is your voice that will continue to take us where you are leading us. I thank you for your voice, and I thank you that it is your voice that's gonna come and change hearts and lives in this afternoon session of Winter Weekend 2020. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and everybody said amen. 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 Everybody say guardrails. That's the name of the message this afternoon, guardrails. Guardrails. So if you're taking notes, and I would suggest that you do, come on, note takers are history makers. If you don't want to do anything with your life, don't take notes in church. Uh, if you want to go somewhere, if you want God to trust you with major things and words for people and destiny and vision and impacting your generation, start taking notes in church. 
That's just for free, uh, and, uh, and we'll move on here. So, so whenever you, how many of you are, uh, have a driver's license and you drive? Come on, let me see your hand. Like, hey, it was a great day. Come on, just wave it at me. Like, it's a big deal. Like, you, you took a driving test and, and you are licensed to drive. Okay, cool. So, so whenever, you, uh, whenever you learn about laws and, and learn how to drive, there, there's something that, that they teach you about uh, called uh, warning signs that are on the road. Now, the, the purpose of warning signs is to alert you of something that is coming up. Each of them are for your safety and for you to be effective. They point to a very real concern. They, they point to a, a greater truth, a reality. And in a similar way, there's also, besides warning signs like, like stop signs and caution signs. And uh, in Colorado, we have a ton of these because we drive through, whenever we're going up to the mountains, we have these things called switchbacks. And so it's super helpful, you know, to know whenever there's like sharp curves and turns, especially whenever there's snow. Just about two and a half weeks ago, my mom and dad were up visiting from Louisiana. They spent about three weeks with us for Christmas and for the holidays. And one of the fun things we got to do, me and my dad, we went snowmobiling. So you have to drive up into the mountains, about a two and a half hour drive from where I live in Colorado Springs to go up to the mountain towns where there's tons of snow and all of that. And so we went snowmobiling, super fun. We're about 15 minutes away from the location that we're going snowmobiling and I hit ice in the middle of the road. I'm driving an SUV. We start spinning out. We slam into a snow embankment. And thank God it was just snow, so the car wasn't damaged, anything. But there we are on the side of the road, and uh, we're like in like six feet of snow. Like, my, like the snow is all the way like up almost above to where the door handle is on my, on my car. Now the good thing is, there were some warning signs letting me know that there were some curbs and, uh, curves and all of that. But, but I just didn't expect it for there to be ice in the center, so I'm going around a curve. Thank God that nobody else was coming because you're talking two lanes up and down this, this, this winding mountain. I'm thankful for like warning signs. But in addition to warning signs, you have sometimes physical structures called guardrails and they are there to help keep you uh, on, on the path, to keep you like from, from what is unsafe for you. So, so just by definition, a, a guardrail is a strong fence at the side of the road or in the middle of an expressway intended to reduce the risk of serious accidents. So a fun fact, they were actually created by the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1935 because so many accidents were happening. They wanted to reduce and prevent accidents from happening. So in 1935, the Civilian Conservation Corps came up with the idea of guardrails. Now, guardrails are primarily found in, in, in three different areas. They're on bridges because there's little room for mistake, okay? Can you imagine driving with your mom or dad or those of you who drive across a bridge with literally nothing on your left or your right? And you're left only to the dependency of yourself to like, whoop, make sure, you know, I hope my power steering fluid ain't running low because, uh, you know, you can hit a, a pothole or something in the road and that wheel will turn and, you know, bye-bye birdie, you know, is over. Um, so they're on bridges. Secondly, they, they are uh, where medians are. So medians, whenever people are driving in opposite directions, you'll find guardrails in the middle of the road. Because listen to this, the closer you are to people going in opposite directions than you, the more protection you need. We'll come back to that. Third place where guardrails are primi primarily found are on curves. Everybody say curves. And that's what I was talking to you about earlier. Whenever me and my dad were going snowmobiling, we were going around this curb. Uh, curves sort of protect you from, from unexpected roadside hazards. Now, here's the thing about a guardrail, you guys. Guardrails are not in dangerous areas they're actually in safe zones, but they sort of carry this message. Hey, stay in front of me and everything will go relatively well with you. Go beyond me, bump up against me, and you run a greater risk of unnecessary destruction 
or even worse, death. Now, if you, if you, are, if you are driving and you're sane, at no point do you ever have the thought, man, they need to take off these stupid guardrails off this bridge. I mean, we all just need to drive, take off the guardrails. You know what I'm saying? I want to live life, you know? Like, no sane person says that. Like, man, I wish this was even more dangerous. I want to risk my life. I want to kill people. I want to, no, nobody ever says that in the natural. No, 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 nobody says that. But I'm wondering how we respond to the spiritual guardrails that Christ has placed in our lives. Are the word of God encourage us to have in our lives? I want to talk to you this afternoon about guardrails and road signs, not as it relates to driving, but to your individual life. You see, because if we're honest, if we're, if we're all like painfully and, and, and truthfully honest, we can all admit that we have hit some areas of purity, pitfalls. We have ran over some relational roadblocks. We've, we've crossed over the line of lying. We've crashed into the ditch of depression or despair. And some of us have went clear off the bridge into a river of regret or smashed against the sign of sin, you guys get the idea. I'm just saying that for some of us, most of these areas could have been avoided. Now the past is the past. We wanna focus on the future. And if you pay attention to the warning signs and with good guardrails in your life, listen to me well, young people, Life is hard enough as it is. You don't need to add in uh, like additives of like complication. You see what I'm saying? Like, like your teenage years, there's gonna be enough crises that you're gonna walk through. Your 20s, there's gonna, be, there's gonna be enough drama to take place. You don't need to manufacture drama. You don't need to create scenarios where it's like, oh man, I wanna break my heart like even more than what I need to. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna walk through condemnation for a couple of years and then kind of come back to the Lord and get, no, 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 no. Life in and of itself is challenging enough because as much as we want to pull heaven down to earth and there is a reality and, and there is a certain level of reality of heaven here on earth because we have Jesus living on the inside of us. Make no mistake, this place is not heaven. We live in a broken world. So bad things are gonna happen. And this will help your theological understanding as well. Because if you have some fairy tale theology that everything is going to be perfect in your life and you hit your latter teen years and you hit your 20s and crisis happens and you're not prepared for it, your faith could be shipwrecked. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where people are free moral agents. So bad things absolutely happen. And it's not God's fault. It's man's fault. This is the reality of how God set this entire thing up. So you can, if you can expect that, there is no contradiction. You don't have to pretend as though you have to have some weaker theology. See, through it all, you can acknowledge, hey, God is good. Man can be evil. And these two, we live in that tension. That's the reality of this world. But there's a better place that's coming. There's another reality that we're gonna step into. It's called the new heavens and the new earth. And Jesus has promised us that that's what, but, 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 but we're, in, we're, we're in the right here. And, and so I'm just telling you, life is challenging enough. I wanna set you up to win. I wanna minimize the amount of pitfalls or, or, or the level of pain that you have to walk through in your life. And I believe that one way God is calling us to do that is to make sure that you have some spiritual guardrails and some warning signs in your life and that you pay attention to them. I was um, in college. It was, my, it was my freshman year of college. And... Uh, I was so excited to go home for the Christmas break. 
And let me tell you why I was so excited to go home for Christmas break. See, my freshman year is my first time like living away. And, and listen, I had a vehicle my senior year of college, but my parents were like, man, we want to teach you some responsibility. We want you to just focus on your schoolwork. We want to give you something to work toward. So leave that car home and we're going to drop you off to college about two and a half hours away. And I'm like, ah, oh, mom and dad, and I threw a tantrum and all this stuff. But then I was like, okay, cool. Like, I'll get over it. We'll make it work. And so focus, work hard. So I came home for the Thanksgiving break, which is about a week or so. So I'm home and I'm like, listen, mom and dad, I only have like two and a half, three weeks of school. Why don't you let me take my car back to school? It's just for two or three weeks. And then I'll drive it back Christmas break. That way you don't have to drive all the way to here. I mean, I don't want to inconvenience you. You know what I'm saying? So there's no need for you to drive and like, but and then I have to drive back like in two weeks. So I'll just drive my car and make it simple for everybody. And uh, some kind of way I was able to talk them into that. Praise God. So I, so I got my car and I'm like living large. You know, I'm not calling for rides anymore. It was a good two and a half to three weeks. I mean, I'm riding all over campus. I'm going to McDonald's whenever I want to. I'm waking up at two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I ain't got to ask nobody for nothing. I want a cheeseburger. I want some fries. Let's go. You know what I'm saying? And who wants to ride with me? You know? And so all of that. So I go from being like on the passenger side of my best friend's ride and like going into being the driver, okay? And so I do all this. And so it comes down to the last day before the winter break or before the semester break. And I remember it, like yesterday, I was at a friend's house and all of us stayed up until 3.49 in the morning. 3.49, I was studying for this math final that I had. The final was at 8 a.m., so we woke up at like about 7, 7.10. I pack up all my things. Oh, no, I drive to school, take the final, took about an hour, packed up my dorm room because I was at a friend's house, packed up my dorm room, stopped back by the house where all my friends were because they didn't have early finals. I was the only one that had to get up that early, but whatever. And so I go, tell them bye. All right, see y'all in four weeks. I'm driving home. Now, I was in a hurry to get home because, listen, um... I just thought it was the coolest thing to be able to work like in retail over Christmas because your boy likes to shop, okay? And so if you're working at the nice stores, then you get all the discounts, all right? And, and so I'm just like, all right. So I have an interview set up as soon as I get home, but I have a short window of time to get home and make it to my interview so I can live my best life and work throughout the Christmas break, have a little change, you know what I'm saying? And then go shopping, okay? So all, I have all of these plans. Uh, uh, I got about three and a half hours of sleep. I pack up my car. I tell my friends goodbye, I get into my car, and I begin to drive down the road. And whenever I was about a block away, I used to have this idea, like, I'm just supposed to turn around and, like, ask one of my friends to pray for me. Which, I mean, I can pray for myself, but I, I, I can't explain. I just had this. So I turn back around. I go back to the house. I uh, tell my, I wake up my roommate. I'm like, hey, I just feel like you're supposed to pray for me. He was one of my accountability bros. He was like one of my main prayer guys. And I'm like, I just want you to pray for me. So he just prays a quick prayer. God, protect Brandon. God, cover him. Let him have a great Christmas break. Whatever, you know. So get in my car. Drive, drive, drive. I'm driving down the road. I start get, to get tired. Now, those of you who have your driver's license, what is one thing that they tell you driver's school to do if you start feeling sleepy on the road. Shout it out to me. So they say pull over. That's one thing. What's something else? Sorry. Roll down the windows. Yep. So roll down your windows like there's air like that's supposed to wake you up. What else? Stop to a gas station. Get some coffee. Right. Okay, I didn't have time to do all of that because remember, I'm trying to live my best life and get home and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like I'm trying to get to my job interview, you know? And so, so I roll down the window. I turn up the music, okay? I even phone a friend and put them on speakerphone and that time it was like these little flip phones. Okay, whatever. It's a totally different generation but it was really innovative at that point because you could have a flip phone instead of like these little like you know, straight phones like the Nokia. That's what we started off with. So I have a flip phone. But the cool thing about the flip phone that I would do is I would put it on speakerphone. I would clip it onto my shirt. Hey, and this was before, you know, like my AirPods that I have now. It was like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. And so I would clip it onto my shirt and it was like, hey, like I can talk, you know, it's great. And so I started talking to somebody, but then I ran out of cell reception because I'm driving through the backwoods in the sticks of Louisiana. I'm 20 minutes away from my hometown. 20 minutes outside of Lake Charles, Louisiana, on the other side of a small little town called Moss Bluff. And I start dozing. I mean, it's bad. It happened so quickly. I literally fall asleep. I'm in a red SUV. And I hit the rumble strips. You know what I'm saying? On the side of the road, it's like, 
and in a day, like I'm, I'm in a deep sleep too. I mean, I'm just like, mm. and I wake up and I'm like, oh! so I, and so I'm on a, a, like an old like highway road. So there's like a whole ditch, like a whole ditch on both sides. Okay. Uh, trees. I mean, the whole nine yards. So I'm like, I ain't trying to slam into a tree. You know what I'm saying? So, so I, it's like, do, 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 do. so I, I turn Left, okay, I get in the other lane and there's an 18 wheeler coming and I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, oh. so, so then I overcorrect, turn hard to the right, so I'm back in my lane, but it's too much. And SUVs are already top heavy. I have all of my college stuff, all of my dorm stuff. So I proceed to go into the ditch. Bam, I roll over once. Bam, roll over twice. Bam, and then another half roll. So I'm upside down at this time. I'm in the ditch, in the mud, in the water, just missed this cold thing called curve. And I'm like between two massive oak trees. I wake up. I'm upside down. I have two T-shirts on, but this T-shirt has a hole in it where the seat belt Upon impact, it actually burned a hole through both of my shirts. It looked like somebody like took, you know, like you take a, a cigarette lighter or something, like, like a lighter and you burn something and it's all burned. That's what my shirt looked like. I mean, it's crazy. And so I hear this woman like, are you okay? Are you okay? And like, they, they, like there's this little group of people and they come. So they pull me out. I remember being pulled out of my car. So it's upside down, seatbelt, you know crawl out, like army crawl out. And I remember looking on the road and like my binders over here, my dorm microwave is over there. The refrigerator's open. I mean, it was just like a nightmare. Papers all over the road. My clothes scattered all over the place. And so I'm just laying there on the side of the road. So they call 911. The EMS guy comes. The emergency, remember I told you I'm only about 25 minutes outside of my hometown. It just so happened that the EMS guy, I go to church with him. We've been going to church together at that point for like seven years. And so he's like, Brandon? And I'm like, I'm so out of it. I don't even recognize him. And so they, they don't know what to, so they put me on a stretcher. They put me in a helicopter. A helicopter uh, goes to the local hospital. By the time I get there, my youth pastor's there, my mom's there, my dad, and by the grace of God, I was released that day. I just had like just this scar on my shoulder that's still there today. But thank God for the rumble strips, the guardrail, if you will, the warning sign, because it was initially the thing that woke me up. Because what you don't realize is that there's something whenever you're on like a, a, a highway roads, they're called like these culverts things and it's solid cement. And you crash into that, and the whole thing is over because it's, you're crashing like literally into a cement hole construction. I thank God for the guardrail, for the warning sign, for the thing that woke me up as I was drifting. For some of us, we can go through the motions of church. We can be around church people, especially here, like in the South. And we can be around all of this God activity and all these amazingly godly people. And if we're not careful, we can be in cruise control mode and we can literally be drifting day by day and week by week. See, one of hell's greatest lies is that you can stand still in your pursuit of Jesus, and it will not cost you something in the long run. One of hell's greatest lies is that you can kind of switch it into cruise control mode in your teenage years and do nothing in, ter in terms of expressing your passion and your hunger for Jesus and some kind of way you're gonna wake up out of that and be in the same place. But listen, heaven is to steer, hell is to drift. Because we live in this thing called a world, the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. 
But what happens is the world system, that means the non-Christ-like way of living your life, of talking, of walking, of speaking, the way that you think, everything, there is this drawing, there is this pulling, there is this enticing that the enemy of your soul has been trying to invade your heart with. And if you are not careful, you can even be in the middle of church, you can be in the middle of Christian activities, and this entire time you have been drifting so you may lift your hand and worship but you're drifting but God loves you so much that if you'll cooperate with him he'll have a guardrail that you'll bump up against and you'll realize how did I get over here like I meant to be over there I can't tell you the amount of, of young people who never planned to be over here because they started over here on their walk with Jesus, but slowly but surely over time, they slipped it into cruise control long enough and just begin to go through the religious motions. And they may even be nice and respectful and polite and say all the same things, but their hearts all the way over here. Does that make sense? As I was thinking about Keegan, whenever I got that news, I just thought, oh God, I pray that the word that was seeded into him, I haven't talked to him in several years, but God, I pray that the word that was seeded into him function as some guardrails that he made wise and he made smart decisions, but it just reminded me Yes, tomorrow's not promised. You got to live today. You got to live today on purpose, with purpose, knowing that God has you here for a reason. That God has you here to do something that no one else on the face of the planet, he didn't call anybody else to do exactly what he's called you to do. And we hear that a lot, and we treat it like this, this trite little phrase in Christian circles, but it is 100% absolutely true that God has something uniquely designed, uniquely planned out, uniquely written, and uniquely in store for uniquely you. You are not an accident. You didn't just show up in South Carolina. You, didn't, you, you don't just happen to go to the school that you are attending. You don't just happen to have the people in your life. No, 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 no. I believe that everything that happens in our lives, God can use it for his glory and for our good. That means it is our responsibility to say, God, what am I here for? God, what am I in this circle for? God, why did you give me these gifts? Why do I love baseball so much? Why do I like this particular video game so much? Why am I drawn to this particular type of person? And if you will live your life that way, you guys, it will even function as a guardrail against spiritual apathy. Does this make sense to anybody this afternoon? Jesus made this so clear whenever he said there's a, there's a wide way that leads to destruction, but there's, there's a narrow road that leads to, leads to life. I want to remind you and encourage you to live your life with some spiritual guardrails that you have in place. See, Ephesians is where I want to go next. Ephesians. And listen, if you're taking notes again, by, by, by guardrails, this is what I mean by, here's how you know if you have spiritual guardrails or not. Because maybe you're confused. You're like, well, Pastor Brandon, I just really don't know. Like what, Pastor, I'm going to make it real easy. If you can tell me two to three spiritual disciplines and then convictions by which you've decided to live your life, that's a good start. If you can't name that, I want to suggest to you that you're probably just kind of floating. You're in cruise control. And the crazy thing about cruise control <laughs> is that it takes very little effort. So at some point or another, you're going you're, you're gonna to go off the bridge. Before you do that, I believe God loves you so much that he wants to say, nope, 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 nope. That off the bridge life, you ain't about that life. <laughs> I've called you to drive. I've called you to lead. I've called you to make a difference. I've called you to live a life that says, no, no, it's 
it starts with me. If anybody in my youth group is going to live with conviction, is going to live with some personal standards, some, some personal convictions, going to live with, is going to be this guy right here. It's going to be this girl right here. And so, so spiritual discipline, spiritual boundaries, if you will, if you can't tell me one boundary you have, if you're already like in the dating season and that's kind of you and your parents are cool with it and your leaders are cool with it and you're doing that, if you can't articulate like two to three, hey, like these are boundaries that we have, like these are things that I just do not do, then you have no guardrails. And it's only a matter of time before you slam into something that you never meant to slam into. And for some of you, you're already there. And Christ the Redeemer, Christ the Healer, Christ the Great EMT has shown up on the scene and said, I want to heal you. I want to redeem you and I want to restore you. But I want to give you some instruction so that we don't have to go this way again. Because as much as it has broken your heart, it's broken mine. Does that make sense to somebody this afternoon? So Ephesians is where we want to go and kind of talk a little bit about guardrails and then we'll wrap this up. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 18. Let me give you the background. Ephesians, this was a very immoral culture. The cultural norm was sexual immorality, living lives that had literally no restraints, no boundaries, no guardrails. That was the norm. So whenever Paul writes to the Ephesian church located in the city of Ephesus, he says this, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Everybody say fools. Don't live like fools. But like those who are wise. Now, if I ask you, hey, you want to be a fool? <laughs> if I ask you just like that, nobody says, oh, yeah, Pastor Brain, I want to live a foolish life. I want to be known as the foolish person Whoever walked the face of the planet, I would have been known as the most foolish person in my family. Nobody says that. But here's what Paul said. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Come on, God's called you to be wise. Verse 16 says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, verse 17, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Verse 18, don't be drunk with wine because that'll ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 says, be careful how you live. The Greek word is actually walk. So be careful how you walk. Be careful how you live your life. Be careful how you, the decisions that you're making every day. Because the small choices, the small right choices make you into a very big person. It's what you do on an everyday basis that determines the trajectory of your life. It's the small decisions that hardly anybody else cares about. But I am telling you, it was those small decisions. Like for me, it looked like, hey, I, there is a season of my life where I'm dedicating everything to Jesus, even relationally. So there is a window in my life that I just did not date because I just thought, man, the time that I'm going to spend investing in her and doing that and, and earning her approval and, and, and making her feel good, I just want to dedicate that time to Jesus. Nobody made me do it. Nobody required that of me. It was just a personal standard. It was one of my guardrails in high school, and it trickled on into part of my college experience. But as I look back, I have no regrets. It was a guardrail for me. Where are your guardrails, you guys? Do you have any guardrails in your life that help to kind of Make sure and keep you, God, I'm guardrails. Guardrails are, are, are godly friends who can actually tell you the truth and you don't spit in their face and defriend them and unfollow them on Instagram because they told you the truth about yourself. Guardrails are small group leaders in your life. How do you treat your guardrails that God has sent to you in the form of a, a small group leader or a youth pastor or a campus pastor, or a mentor in your life. It can be a mom, it can be a dad, it can be somebody else's mom or dad. How do you treat your guardrails, you guys? Do you have any guardrails? 
Here's the thing about guardrails. Nobody can force them upon you. Nobody can be like, all right, I'm gonna be a guardrail in your life. <laughs> like the crazy thing is God's given you the freedom and the wisdom to say, hey, choose you this day. You're gonna live your life with a guardrail, multiple guardrails, or, or nah. <laughs> yeah, nah. Y'all living with guardrails or nah? <laughs> That's the offer that Christ makes to you. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what the Lord's will is. This is interesting because the tense, remember I told you New Testament was written in Greek. So, so, the, so the, the Greek tense of this is like understand, like it's in the imperative, which means this is something that you can do. Because a lot of times I think we use excuses like, I just don't know what God wants me to do. But anything that God commands us to do, he gives us the grace to actually obey. Otherwise, we could disobey with the excuse of God. I just don't understand. But, 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 but he says this, understand what God's will is. Now, this is great news because that means that you can actually understand what God's will is for your life. I want you to face up. I want you to accept. I want you to embrace what you know in your heart that God's will and God's plan is for your life regarding how you spend your time and what you do with relationships and friendships, your values, your, your convictions, your character. I want you to stop deceiving yourself. I want you to stop playing games. I want you to stop smoothing things over and pretending. I want you to face up to what you know that God's will is for your life. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse three says this, God's will for your life. You ready for this? To be holy. To stay away from all sexual sin. That's a great place to start. <laughs> Whenever you're on the journey of discovering God's ultimate will for your life, a great place to start is, all right, Lord, I want my life to be holy. And you know what that means? Set apart. You know what that means for our terms today? A life that's full of guard, guardrails. A life that's full of people that are wiser than us around us because I'm telling you, God hasn't called any one of us to figure this out on our own. I love the phrase, even as, as Brandon was sharing last night, this idea of, of family. Family is one of God's spiritual guardrails. And you say, Brother Brandon, my family's psychotic. Okay, well, great. Spiritual family is one of God's guardrails in your life. And I just wanna ask you, who is that in your world? And for others of you, I want to ask, who are you allowing God, who are you allowing God to use you to be a guardrail to? Because it's not just about you and me. And my, no, 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 no. It's, hey, I want to have a real conversation with somebody, even if it's over text, and say, hey, I feel like God's called me to be one of the guardrails in your life. I don't think I'm better than you. I don't think I'm smarter or wiser than you. I just wanna obey God. I just wanna love you the way that Christ has called me to love you as my friend, and I wanna be a guardrail in your life. And would you be a guardrail to me? Like whenever you see me just wilding out at school, <laughs> or whenever you see me treat somebody poorly, or whenever you hear me gossip, or whenever you see me doing whatever, I want you to be a guardrail because I wanna be wise. See, here's, here's the thing about this afternoon's word. It's so simple, it can be overlooked and minimized, and you're like, eh, 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 let's just go on. But I believe it's simple obedience that God is looking for. It's almost too simple to be true. But I believe that there are several of you this afternoon who would say, it starts with me. I'm gonna start obeying the simple things that God has called me to, and I'm just gonna see how that works out for me. I'll tell you this, it's gonna go well with you. My challenge to you, to some of you in this room this afternoon, is written on the screen. Stop flirting with disaster. 
in your life. Sin sucks. It sucks the life out of you. It sucks the joy out of you. It sucks the desire to live for God out of you. It sucks purpose out of you. It sucks love out of you. It sucks the reality of who God has called you to be and your awareness of that. It'll take it right out of you because you will have a hard time believing that you really are who God says you are. Stop flirting with disaster. Some of you, I sense it's so strong that the Holy Spirit would say, you have literally been going over the rumble strips in terms of some of your relationships, <laughs> some of the friendships that God has sent, sent to you, some of the decisions that you're making. Your life has constantly sounded like this spiritually. <laughs> And the Lord's like, hey, what I'm trying to say to you is wake up. Wake up because there's so much more that I have for you. It's like the last song that we were just singing in worship. There is more that God has called to echo through you. You were intended for more. Here's the deal, you guys. I'm in my 30s now. My journey with Jesus started as a teenager. It started, I got really, really serious with Jesus at about the age of 15. And, and here's what has kind of, here's what's, what's fed and fueled that hunger for God. I refuse to believe the lie that the experiences that I had of God, the measure, if you will, how much of God I had experienced I refused in every season, every year of my life to ever believe that that was all of God that I could have. In other words, I made a decision at 15 and then I made another decision at 16 and then I made that same decision at 17, at 20, at 23, at 28, again at 31, at 33, at 35, and then finally when I turned 36 this year, I made a decision, me and the Lord, nothing public, just privately, God, I want more of you. I am not content. I want all of you that you are willing to give me. And I want to know you more. That can even be a guardrail in your life or something that strengthens the guardrails in your life, you guys. Verse 18, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. In the NIV, it says this, don't be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. That's this kind of Bible word. You don't hear it a lot, but, but here's what it means. Extreme indulgence that results in a complete loss of control. Are you engaging in anything Anything, like it can be video games. It can be Netflix. You just get lost into, like hours have gone by. No, 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 no. It, it can be social networking, Instagram. It can be Snapchat where you were just constantly thinking about. That's the last thing you think about whenever you go to bed at night. It's the first thing you think about whenever you wake up in the morning. That's debauchery. That's an over ex extreme indulgence that results in a complete loss of control. Is it gossip? Is it talking about someone? Is it just being so like indulgent? in like somebody else's life and you're struggling with the spirit of comparison. You see, 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 God is against anything that will lead to a loss of control in our lives. But I love this about that same verse. Don't be drunk with wine, our New, in, New International Version, which says, don't be drunk with wine, which is debauchery. Don't, don't give yourself into an extreme indulgence as something that can control you. But, but be filled with the Spirit of God. See, there's no limitation guardrail needed in your pursuit of God. You can never have too much of him. You can never read your Bible enough. You can never worship enough. You can never pray enough. You can never, you, you can never go, go to where it's like, all right, you're doing too much, like you're reading too much of your word. I don't think God's ever gonna tell you that ever. You see what I'm saying? Oh, like you're just spending too much time in prayer. Like you just need to, you know, kind of press pause on the prayer. No, no, there's no limitation needed in your pursuit of God. See, some of you have been chasing after all of these material things because there is a hunger and an unquenchable desire deep down on the inside of you that you don't even realize, it'll never be satisfied. 
no matter how many likes you get on Instagram, our followers you get, our interactions on Snapchat, until you come to this place of realizing, God, it's you I have actually been wanting this entire time. It's your presence that I crave. I just didn't know it. I didn't realize it. And now that I have some guardrails, it's like, oh, light bulbs are going off for me. I need you. I want you. God desires for you to give yourself fully to the Lord. See, the Holy Spirit of God, he longs to be the primary influencer on your life. See, it's so foolish, you guys, to think that you can say whatever it is that you want to say, that you can do whatever you want to do, that you can treat people poorly, that you can do all of that stuff and, and tell lies to yourself like, oh, well, it's no big deal. God's going to protect me. See, sometimes God will take you through seasons in your life where people will approach you and say, hey, why? Why can't you, why can't you, you fill in the blank? Why can't you date? Why can't you, why can't you watch this movie? Why, why can't you listen to this music? And, and, and here's the response. It's not that I can't, I just, I won't. <laughs> Let's get really honest for a moment. What are the lyrics to some of the songs that is the primary music that you listen to on your Spotify or your iTunes account. I know, dead silence. Preach, Pastor Brandon, come on, that's good. That's a good word, Pastor Brandon. Thank you so much. I mean, I agree too. Thank you so much, Brandon. I appreciate that. What are the lyrics? Because whatever you are listening to with your ears, it has an open thoroughfare, an open highway to your heart. And what's in your heart will come out in your behavior eventually. What's the content of the books that you primarily like to read? If you're, a, if you're, if you're, if you're an avid reader, what's the content of, of the movies that you're consistently watching or the TV shows or the Netflix shows? I'm just asking because whenever you don't have guardrails, you don't know any better. But sometimes the Lord will send guardrails in the form of a word from God in the middle of a session to say, I love you way too much for, to keep, for you to keep driving like this. Like if this is the highway, if you're, this is the bridge and that's the ditch where you're just like, ee, like teeter-tottering. <laughs> and he's like, I just love you too much. I didn't call you to live over here. I call you to live right in the middle of that highway so you can go fast and furious for me, so you can win souls for me, so you can spread my love and my peace, so you can actually make an impact on your generation. You'll never get there without guardrails, you guys. And I'm speaking from the word of God, but also my personal experience. See, whenever you have guardrails in your life, I want the worship team to come. Whenever you have guardrails in your, in your life, you're not saying you can't. You're saying, no, I just, I won't. Like, I, I don't do those things. Whenever your friends come to tempt you to do something that you know is a violation of God's word, Deep down inside, you hear this voice saying, mm, don't do it. And your response is, I'm not saying you can't. I'm not saying I can't. I'm just saying I won't. That's a guardrail for me. I'm just not going there. I'm not doing that. There are better things. You see what I'm saying? A guardrail can be, you know what? I'm not, I'm not missing small group this week. I, I could, but I won't. I'm not missing, I am not, I am not showing up late and missing worship. I'm not saying I can't, I'm saying I won't. 
I'm not going to that event this weekend because I already know what's going to be there and who's going to be there and that's going to tempt me and I know the past and the struggles that I had. I'm not saying that I can't. I'm saying I, I won't. I made a vow to Jesus and I actually intend to keep it this year. I'm not saying I can't watch that. I know it's a cool show and everybody's talking about it. Or I'm not saying I can't, you guys. Do you know how many conversations I've had just like that? I'm not making up illustrations. I'm talking about my life. Like where I have to look at Christian friends and be like, I'm not saying you can't. I'm not even saying I can't. Brandon, you're being too extreme. I have a destiny on my life. Brandon, like, what's the big deal? Like, it's, I mean, uh, everybody else is doing it. I'm not saying I can't. I'm just saying that I won't because I've chosen to live my life with guardrails. I have spiritual goals in place. I know that God has called me to live at a higher level. I know that God has called me to win the loss. I know that God has called me to be an example in speech and in purity and in the way that I live my life. So I'm not saying that I can't. I'm saying that I won't because he has a calling on my life. This message isn't for everybody in this room. I could pretend like it was. I'm speaking to those who know you have a calling on your life. And the Lord is reminding you of that calling because several of you have forgotten. Several of you have fallen asleep at the wheel. And the Holy Spirit of the living God is saying, wake up! Because you've got a window. Wake up! Because there are people that I am sending to you that I want you to use your story. I want to use your voice. I want to use your mouth. I want to use your example. I want to use your convictions to touch them. I want to use your love to reach them where others could not reach them. I am calling you to reach them. I'm calling you to reach your family. I'm calling you to be the first in your family, maybe for some of you who have really sold out and gone all out for Christ at an early age. See, nobody who's in their 20s who's actually serving Jesus or their 30s, 40s, or 50s say, gosh, I wish I would have waited later to serve God. Nobody. Go and ask them. If you don't believe me, go and ask them. Ask anybody over 20 who truly has a vibrant relationship with Jesus now and, and, and ask them when they started serving God and then ask them this question. Do you wish you would have waited a little bit longer? I promise you every single one will say, I wish I knew at 14 what I now know at 25. Come on somebody and preach with me. Every single one of them will say, oh God, I, I wish I would have known at 18 what I'm now learning about God and God's word at 30. Don't let that be you. That doesn't have to be you. God's got better in store for you because his love for you is so strong. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate the highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Green light. The world is open. I can go anywhere I want. I pray, God, put up roadblocks where I shouldn't go. That should be all I need. So I drive aimlessly. I can go where I please. Why can't I just take the scenic route to my destiny? I used to stay on the straight and narrow, but what is wrong with a little detour? Those lights flashing, slow down, were judging me. So I yelled, get out of my face. And I ran them over. Yellow light. Slow down. 
everything feels a bit out of control. So I tap the brakes yet. Every time I do, I don't seem to slow down as quickly, skidding a little further every time. The grinding crunch as I make contact, contact with the guardrail, it used to jolt me awake. Now I've gotten used to the sound. In fact, why are these barriers here anyway? They just get in the way and take away my freedom, telling me I can't do what I want. This is America. Aren't I entitled to see what's on the other side if I want to? I'm gonna crash through and embrace being free. Stop. Why didn't I stop? I saw the fork in the road and I took the one that looks more fun. Never stopping to think, where does this road lead? God, why didn't you warn me? But deep down, I know I didn't seek your voice. I didn't seek it in prayer. I drowned you out with every voice who told me what I wanted to hear. I didn't seek directions through time in your word. I took directions from people who didn't know where I wanted to go. It just happened so fast. I always thought you would put up a roadblock to stop me, although you've been putting up warning signs the whole time. I ran through them and ignored you like my nearsighted grandma in her SUV. I heard God's voice begging me to yield, warning me what was down this path. This road looks so wide and easy to travel. However, it's led, led to my destruction, my spirit screaming at me to make a U-turn but I kept barreling ahead like a drunken driver. This crash left me calling out for AAA or AA or anyone who will help. Calling out for anyone. But I know all I needed was you. Why didn't I stop? Stop. For some of us, that short poem, it's the narrative of our current situation. It's a description of where we are and where we have been. And we have a God in this afternoon session who would say, stop everything. Because I have sons and daughters right here in the middle of this winter weekend that I'm saying, stop. Because you don't know the destruction that's on the other side of this life that you've chosen to live with no guardrails. See, for some of you, the guardrail you've been running over constantly, it's some sin, it's some, some issue that, that you just, I mean, it's just become so common. But then for others of you, it's just not living wisely. You've been trying to do it all on your own. You have no guardrails. You don't listen to anyone. You're not intentional about going to some of your leaders and saying, hey, uh, what's, your, what's your advice for me? Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, I, I've got some decisions to make. Hey, my friends are telling me this one thing, but, but, but I, I want you to speak into this. I wanna, I wanna walk in humility because I wanna walk in wisdom. And I know that Proverbs says that there's safety. Hello guardrails and a multitude of counsel. Are you living your life with guardrails? That's what I want you to think about this afternoon. And I want to give you a chance to respond to that. And then secondly, that's one. Secondly, do not be filled with wine where in is excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. God wants you to live your life with no restraints in your pursuit of His Holy Spirit in your life. The way to maintain, you guys, and to grow what God starts in you, this is what happens. We go into camp experiences over the summer. We come to winter weekends. We go to youth conferences. And then we leave with no guardrails. So what happens is a week later, we're back in the same ditch of despair, 
The same tumultuous temptation, saying yes, bowing and bending to whatever that temptation is in your life, bowing and bending to those lies. But God wants you to do things differently this year. He says, I wanna give you some guardrails. Here's the beautiful things about, thing about guardrails. If you're driving and you bump up against one, yeah, your car's a little bit dented, but your life is okay. Yeah, there's a little bit of consequences. Listen, you're gonna make some dumb decisions. Got a prophetic word for you. <laughs> you're gonna make some dumb decisions in your life. We've all been there, even your parents. God bless them. But, but here's the reality. You can come out of those decisions with like a dent <laughs> or completely crashed upside down in a ditch. I'm just saying, <laughs> I picked the dent. <laughs> Dents ain't that much. Those insurance premiums will go up sometimes, but you know, you know, maybe you can work it off and not even file the claim, okay? God wants you to live wise, you guys. It starts with me. Say, I'm gonna be a young person who lives with some guardrails, and I'm gonna be a model for those around me. I want you to stand up to you this afternoon. I want you to stand up to your feet. I want every head bow, every eye closed this, this afternoon. And I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I want to pray with you. And I believe that God is going to, he's going to give you something on the inside. As you say yes to him, he's going to give you some ideas of some guardrails. For those of you who've been crashing over the guardrails in your life, he's going to say, hey, 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 hey. Let's get out of that position and let's come to this position I want you to be a young person of wisdom. That's what God's destiny is for your life. Every head bow, every eye closed this afternoon. If you're here this afternoon and you know, you know what? This word is for me. And I have been without guardrails for far too long. Spiritual guardrails. And I am really serious about living with guardrails about living my life that way because I long to grow in wisdom. I don't want to be foolish. If that's you, I want you to shoot your hand up really high very quickly on the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. You can put your hand down. Here's the Here's the prayer. I want you to pray and just, I want you to repeat after me and I'll do a secondary moment. We'll worship together. I want you to pray this prayer. Just say, Jesus, I repent for living foolishly. I receive your forgiveness. You've called me to be wise. Wisdom is not an age. Wisdom is revelation. Thank you for revealing to my heart today my lack of guardrails. Now, Spirit of God, speak to me now what guardrails are missing in my life. Now, expect for him to speak. Close your eyes. He's a talking Jesus. There's several of you this afternoon. You can keep your eyes closed. I just keep hearing the voice of the Lord say that he has well established you with guardrails in the form of your parents. And there has been this rebellious, like, I don't want to do what you say. This, like, immature it was like this nastiness. That's what I gotta say to how I feel it. And the Lord says, I want you to repent because you don't even know what I'm trying to protect you from. If that's you, I want you to shoot up your hand on the count of three because God's gonna break that right off of you. One, two, three, that's you. Yeah, that's good. This is called a ding against the card rail. Your next step would have been a ditch. Yeah. 
you can put your hand down and right there between you and the Lord, even if it's just at a whisper, I want you to repent for that. I told you last night, guys, revival starts with repentance. You can't walk in this rebellious spirit and expect for revival to flow through your little hands. It doesn't happen that way. So just repent. You don't have to drag yourself with sackcloth and ashes. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm gonna embrace the guardrail that you have given me and my parents, my mom and my dad. I thank you for them. I bless them today. I honor them. I see them as a gift in my life, in Jesus' name. It's phrases like that. And just like that, the blood of Jesus touches your heart. It's over. It's done with. There's this thing called making it right, where the Holy Spirit will prompt you. Some of you need to have a conversation with your mom or dad. Some of you need to send them a text message right now and say, I'm so sorry. Thank you for the gift that you are in my life. If that's you, don't worry. The Holy Spirit will prompt it right in your heart. Like your heart's beating fast. You have that weird kind of feeling in your stomach. That's the Holy Spirit saying, yep, I'm asking you to do that. You don't have to, but I would love for you to. That's him, you guys. You're hearing his voice. He's just that close and intimate with you. He cares about every detail of your life. Every head bow, every eye closed. There are a couple others of you. You are in a relationship. Some of you, it is a dating relationship. Some of you, it's friendships. And it's a disaster. And you can feel, I mean, the Holy Spirit right now is giving you almost like visions of slamming up against guardrails in a car. If you're seeing that kind of in your mind's eye, feeling that even with your heart, I want you to lift up your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. The good news is he loves you enough to speak to you. You're his. <laughs> he doesn't correct those who aren't his. He says, those whom I love and I know, I chasten them, I correct them, I discipline them. You can put your hand down and right where you are, if you're serious about paying attention to that guardrail, I want you to pray a simple prayer that says, Lord, forgive me for slamming against the guardrail of the wrong relationships. And I'm ready to change those. You can't just end negative relationships. You have to replace them with Christ honoring relationships. So what you're really praying is and saying, Lord, I'm committed to forming some godly friendships and relationships. I'm gonna do a better job of that this year, like never before, like before I leave conference, like before the day is over. I'm gonna have some conversations with people. I'm gonna talk to some leaders and say, help me figure out this thing of friendships because I'm not doing a good job. That's the Holy Spirit. He loves you. Lastly, if you're here, we're not gonna raise our hand, we're just gonna come to the altar and say, I really, I wanna encounter the Holy Spirit in my personal life in a, in a stronger way. I wanna give, I wanna yield myself more to, to the Spirit of Jesus like never before. I want you to step out from where you are and I want you to come to this altar. The Bible says this, the spirit of the Lord yearns jealously for you. He is so jealous for you. He is so committed to you. Several of you who raised your hands earlier, what you're really acknowledging and saying is, hey, the Holy Spirit, he was talking to me. That was him. He convicts you whenever you're wrong. 
He encourages you whenever you are. Like just you lack courage, you lack direction, you lack what he gives you everything you need to be the Christ honoring teenager and young person that God has called you to be. And you would do well to begin listening to his voice in your life. Saying, Spirit of God, fill me. Spirit of God, lead me. Spirit of God, I yield to you like never before. He loves you. He's God's expression of love to you. With your eyes closed at this altar, and I just want you to posture your hands like you're receiving a gift from your heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, I ask that you just begin to encounter every hungry young person at this altar this afternoon from the left to the right. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you begin overwhelming them with the presence and the power of who you are in their lives. I pray that everything that isn't pleasing to you, that isn't honoring of you, that doesn't follow your voice and your wisdom, you would begin to expose and begin to remove. And I pray that the joy of your presence, your ministry, will begin filling hungry hearts even now. Every guy, every girl in the name of Jesus. I pray for the spirit of holiness to be their desire unquenchable desire for you all their days. The same as you did in my life as a teenager. Would you do in them? I pray for boldness, for confidence, for desire on the inside to please Jesus and Jesus alone. I pray for a God confidence that can only come from who you are. I say fill every hungry heart God, in those who feel like they have nothing to offer, I pray that you tell them again who they are, the high value that they carry, those struggling with self-image, those struggling with actually believing what you say about them. I break the lies of the enemy by the power of the Holy Spirit right now. I pray that their guardrails would be strong and tall. I pray that humility would cause those guardrails to go up around them and to increase in their lives in Jesus' name. I thank you that they are wise beyond their years that they are not fools, that they are not stupid or dumb. Father, I thank you that even those who've made dumb and foolish decisions, that they would know they are not their choices. They are not their past. I thank you that your blood takes care of it and the Holy Spirit of the living God affirms it on the inside. I thank you that the Spirit of God on the inside of them, which cries out, Abba, Father, would confirm in them who they are. Chosen ones. Your spirit is holy and so are they by your power this afternoon. Holy Spirit, come. Heal every broken heart. Fill every empty heart with joy right now on the inside. God, your love makes all the difference in the world. And I pray that it would be carriers of that love in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I want you to continue just lean in and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as the worship team comes forward. And we just begin to worship together. The Holy Spirit's so real, you guys, and his voice is strong in this room right now from the front all the way to the back, if you'll just press in and say, God, what is it? What is it that you're saying to me? What is it that you're, what else are you speaking to me? I want you to make a fresh commitment to obey him, truly obey him, fully obey him. 
For some of you, there's some decisions that God is calling you to make and it feels so scary and it feels so sacrificial. But here's what the Lord wants to remind you of. There is no sacrifice. There is nothing that you've ever given up or that he'll ever ask you to do that he won't give back to you something far greater. But he's got to free up your hands. He's just got to free up your hands. Father, I thank you that you're anointing even right now in the name of Jesus, as we empty our hands, you're filling us with greater. You are filling us with more. Some of you have been so selfish and the Lord's saying, just take your eyes off of you for a moment. And I'm gonna make you aware of some people around you in your life that actually need you. You're so busy thinking what you need, what you want, what you don't have. And the Lord's saying there are multitudes around you and there are a handful specifically that he wants to use your hands to bless. He wants to use your hands to touch. You are that powerful. You are that important. You are that significant. He loves you. Like a 